If you have over $200,000 sitting stagnant in your bank, retirement account, or home equity, then you're literally losing money. On this show, you learn how to get that money working for you consistently and conservatively. Learn to grow your nest egg with your host, Sean Winslow. Let's dive in. Welcome back to another Multifamily Monday episode. I'm your host, Sean Winslow, and this is the Multifamily Money Podcast. What's going on, everybody? You know the drill. Coming at you on Mondays with all things multifamily real estate investing, because that's how we believe we can get your money working not only harder, but smarter for you. And today, I want to specifically talk about why multifamily um, is such a great asset class. And I, d- I did an episode on this v- at the very beginning um, of this show. And if you haven't heard that one, I would highly suggest um, going back and taking a look at that. And that's episode 15, why I love multifamily real estate. So go take a listen to that if you haven't already. But this episode today, let's just get right into it. I was on Twitter. Um, for those of you that aren't on Twitter, I would highly recommend it. It's it's a great place for real estate, Twitter, for real estate finance. A lot of smart minds, not even just that, just you know, there's a lot of smart minds on there in general, a lot of smart finance minds, business minds, really anything you can, you can think they're on there and there's some great follows. So if you're not on there, I'd highly recommend it. But I came across one that that I follow and this person invests in multifamilies, but a uh, apparently also invests in single family rentals as well, which I didn't know until I read this post. Um, anyways, they said, you know, the reasons they still buy single family rentals, they acknowledge buying multifamilies is the fastest way to grow your portfolio, but they have gave 10 takes on why single family rentals. And I read it. And as you can imagine, yes, I'm a little biased, but I did not, agree with it whatsoever. You know, obviously there are some points that can be made for sure. Um, but let's just go down through them and I'll, I'll give my, my rebuttal. So the first is there is more competition in the larger multifamily space. You are competing against veteran investors who can pull many strings to make a deal work. Could be a while before a deal comes through. There's an opportunity cost of just waiting. Of course, yeah, there's an opportunity cost of just waiting, but there's also an opportunity cost of just pulling a trigger to do a deal. And that's both in single family or multifamily. You know, you you should wait for the right deal. You shouldn't just do it because you think there's some opportunity cost of not putting your money to work. If that's the case, just park it in treasuries right now. You're going to get, you know, anywhere from four to five and a half percent. So there you go, park it there until you find something. Um, but his point about, you know, the competition, yeah, there is a lot of competition multifamily. I'm sure there's a bunch of competition in, you know, single family rentals. I go to all these uh, conferences and and see on social media, majority of people are doing single family. So, and plus you, then you're competing with the everyday person who just wants to buy a home. So I can't imagine that the competition is much different. And also you mentioned larger multifamily space. So we're talking about a single family home versus hundred, 200 unit complex. Yeah, there, there's competition there, but there's there's a reason for that, and and it it doesn't mean you can't get in there. You just it takes more activity, it takes more action. You just got to be consistent and disciplined. You still find deals. Um, yeah, it's tougher, but they're still out there. There's also deals in the middle there between you know ten and fifty, ten and sixty units where you know it's too small for those big players you're mentioning here, but too, too big for the, the mom and pop single family guys, even though I don't think it's too big, but you know, in their, in their mind, they think it's too big. So there's less competition. Um, so I, I don't agree, agree with that. And we'll come back to this point later because he references something that, um, this directly is a positive of. So keep this point in mind. Um, next I've unwritten, I've underwritten hundreds of deals now. Single family returns tend to be higher, at least in my market, by a minimum of a couple of points. Um, you know, I'll take his word for it, but in my market, that's not the case. Um, what you pay here for a single family home is significantly higher than what you would pay per door for a multifamily. And the difference in rents does not justify that price. So in my market and the markets that I'm in, that is not the case. And if we're talking about large multifamilies, which he referenced in the last point, 
then this is definitely not the case because those trade on NOI, net operating income, you know, commercial multifamily. And those returns are going to be significantly higher, which we've seen the last couple of years. You know, people are willing to pay, you know, ridiculous cap rates to get yield, to get income, right? His next point in his next point in this one is also utilities are on tenants, less turnover, and rents are higher. The majority of all my units, utilities are on tenants. So I don't understand that point. Um, and I'm sure there can be single family houses where you where you're paying for the for the utilities. So that I don't I don't get that less turnover. It depends, right? It it depends the market you're in. There's some markets where there's gonna be higher turnover because of the industry there. But yeah, I'll get I'll give them that for sure. They're generally, you know, there's a family that are gonna be in there and they're gonna be there for a significant time. But then again, it could be a family that's just in there until they find a place they want to buy. And and people who who rent a single family home tend to be in more of a position to go buy a home versus certain communities who are that are renters, right? Where they tend to be more renters for life. So could it could also be where there is less turnover. And the thing about turnover in single family is that's your one income source. So if they're out, that hits you harder. Yeah, in multifamily, at points in time, it might be more turnover, but with the scale of the size of the building, the number of units, it really, really lessens that blow to a point. If you're managing property, you don't even really feel it. And then his last point, and rents are higher. Generally, yes, but relative to expenses, it, it's a wash, right? You know, still going to make generally, in my experience, more per unit in profit, um, just from the economies of scale uh, that you're getting from a, a larger asset. So yeah, the rents might be higher per door, but you only have one door versus I have a bunch of doors and my overhead is vastly reduced per unit because I have that scale. Passivity. So right when I read that at first, I'm like, you got to be kidding me because there's no such thing as passivity in real estate. You know, unless you're a limited partner, that's the closest you're going to get to passivity. And that there's still, it's still not complete passivity, right? If we want to get the definition here, because um, you're still doing due diligence on the front end of the deal, signing docs, wiring money, and then checking in every month, every quarter, whatever it happens to be. But passivity in terms of acting investing, I don't think there's, in my, in my experience, in my humble experience, there's no such thing. So he says, I wanted to build a passive income without involvement in downstream property management. Single families attract better quality tenants and most and mostly families. Hence, you can be more hands-off and passive. That is not true. There's always going to be something to do involved in downstream property management. That can actually help in passivity if you have the right team in place. And when he referenced, and the reason why I go back to large multifamily is because he referenced it at the beginning. So if you're talking about large multifamily here, that, that can afford to not only pay property management, but on-site staff. So that's going to reduce your hands-on approach. Yes, you're going to want to manage them or at least have an asset manager. And if it's your certain scale, you're going to be able to afford to pay an asset manager that manages the on the property management company that manages the on-site staff. Um, and so that's the the downstream he's talking about. So that kind of, cre- cre- in, in my opinion, that creates more passivity, even though there's, again, no such thing as passivity in this game. So, and he says, you know, better quality tenants. Well, if you have the right management in place, they're still going to get great quality renters. You know, there's there's great people that rent. I think that's a, a really poor assessment right there, just because they're renting in a apartment building versus a single family home, that they're less quality that I do not agree with that. Yes, other circumstances that happens, of course, but you still can get some poor quality tenants in a single family home. It's all about upfront due diligence before you're bringing in them on. It's all about that due diligence on the the prospective resident. Um, long-term growth, approximately 33 billion of single family rentals assets are currently owned by institutional real estate investors, but some estimates peg the total single family home market at four and a half trillion, which leaves plenty of room for growth. Okay, fair enough. Um, it's That is a small segment, but there's also a huge segment of people that are trying to buy homes and not be rent and not be renters or not, not be um, investors, excuse me. Well, and consequently, they don't want to be a renter because that's why they want to buy, right? So you're competing against that segment too. You're not just competing against institutional investors, whereas in large multifamily or multifamily in general, you're mostly just 
competing against other investors. You're not really competing against someone who wants to live in it. You know, maybe if it's a you know two to four unit, yeah, maybe a small amount of people want a house hack, something like that. But other than that, you're just competing against other investors. So I'd say there's way more competition in single family rentals because not only is it other investors, institutional investors, um, it's also people like you and I that want to buy a home. Professional investors account for only 2% of the US single family home sales. So continued on this point op- equals opportunity. Even the big boys are on it. Since the pandemic, over 15 billion of equity has been raised by different institutions to invest in single family space, single family rental space. On the supply side, the inventory of homes for sale has decreased by a whopping 75% since 2007, 4 million homes in 2007 to 1 million homes in 2021. Well, why is that? We, you know, numbers are great and numbers can tell whatever story you want them to tell. But if you got to go back and understand why those numbers will or what they were. The reason for that is because there was a extreme overbuilding of single family homes leading up to 2007 and the crash. You know, if you've seen that the movie, The Big Short, yes, it's a dramatization, but there's a lot of facts in there. And one of the things is, you know, when he's going to meet the, uh, you know, the lady at that certain gentleman's club, let's call it, uh, she says she has seven properties. Um, they're not even really investment properties. She just keeps buying condos and has variable, you know, adjustable rate mortgages on them, which is a, not what I'm trying to get into in a whole different story of part of the reason why everything blew up, but they were given loans to anyone, right? Essentially you could like, you know, the, the saying you could fog a mirror, you get a loan. So people were building, builders were building because there was a market, there was a demand to sell to, and there's a huge oversupply and overbuilding of homes, which was a small, was a part in the crack. And because of that, there was less need to build homes. And on top of that, after the crash, there's less financing and capital that was going to go into build homes, even if people wanted to. So it went from about 20 million household formations per year leading up to the 08 crash to from, you know, 09 to 20, about 5 million per year. So extreme decrease. And that's the reason why. And now that can be an argument while well, there's more for you and I to buy. And that's great. But there's also that factor of of people that want to buy homes to live. And we don't know what's coming down the pike of does the government get involved? And you know, I'm I'm not saying they should. I, I say, you know, let the markets take care of themselves, but they could. They could get involved and reduce investments on single family rentals to afford everyday people being able to buy a home if they if they choose to. That's a risk. They're not going to do that in multifamily because multifamily is for rentals. People aren't buying it as homes. So there always is that risk. Similarly on this, onto the demand side, he says, the primary single family rental demographic, 35 to 44 age group is expected to be one of the fastest growing cohorts within the, the US population. 1.4% Kager, um, so compounded annual growth rate over the next five years. Solid point, but more and more people are still wanting to rent, partly because they can't afford the homes and they also just don't want to maintain. And there is still a vast majority of people that like the apartment building setup. Um, I moved from a city to a rural area and there's a bunch of people that did the same during the pandemic. And in my area, there's several complexes that give that city feel from design to set up, you know, communal trash, you know, you walk down the hallway, trash chute, concierge, mail room, all that stuff. And they like that. Yes, they came to this area for the, sp- the space outside, but they like that setup. So there's still a strong need for apartments. Next point, single family rent growth has historically been more stable across economic cycles than multifamily. The resilience is also showcased in the long-term occupancy. He has a graph here but he's only looking over 20 years, which to me is not a great sample size. Yes, there can be more vol- be a lot more volatility in 20 years. Now I pulled up some numbers and if we look at it, average rent prices have increased 8.85% per year since 1980. Um, so we're talking, you know, 43 years here. And if we look, you know, it's been pretty steady. Yeah, it goes down occasionally. Um, and there's some big pops, but there's only been really one year in that time frame that it's it's gone down, and that was in 2000. It's either been up or flat, and when it's flat, it's 
barely flat and then can be up, you know, so it's a- still averaging that, that eight plus percent. And if you look at it on a graph from 1940, if you're watching this video, it is that steep, you know, we're talking a good pitch here taken up. So I don't necessarily agree with that. The next point, much ignored facet of single family strategy is that single families give two exit options. You can sell it to another investor or a home buyer. More competition equals higher selling price and less exit risk. Now I want to go back. And now remember I told you, keep that first point in mind. Let's go back to the first point. There's more competition in larger multifamily space. You are competing against federal investors who can pull many strings to make a deal work. So I think the answer is right there. I thought <laughs> you said it. There's more competition in multifamily. So the exit should be stronger, right? And as I mentioned, more people are buying at ridiculous cap rates for that NOI. So thanks for proving that point for me. The next single family housing is predominantly a mom and pop investor play, giving investors with business and technology acumen an advantage to squeeze out more margins. Yeah, for sure. It's the same in the multifamily space. Real estate in general is is the like an old old guard. They're really slow. They don't really move at the time. So people then come in with technology on the bigger stuff too. On the big multifamilies, it helps a lot. You know, people still we still buy assets where it's like, what are you doing? You're running like you know, your, your financials I don't even know what financials mean. You know, they're got stuff on written paper or just telling it in a PDF, whatever it happens to be, you know? So I think those two go together. And again, to the point of scale, you know, if you can create better margins because technology and then put scale on top of that, it's just going to explode, explode your profit. So next, he mentions the vid tailwinds. The pandemic tailwinds have increased the desire for space and given rise to remote work. More people want to move into single families than ever. The latest data shows even the mandate to come back into office is not working so well. People want freedom of mobility. I think that's an argument for apartments, to be honest. Um, yeah, they want more space. Well, then you need to focus more on two to, f- to four bedroom units. That's what people want so they can have an office bigger square footage in the units. And I mentioned this this earlier on the show is that there's people that are moving from cities to more rural areas to get space, but they still want to live in that type of apartment building because that's what they're used to. That's what they like. They like to be surrounded by people. They like the amenities all in one place. So yeah, I, I think that's great argument for apartments and the mobility too, right there, that you freedom of mobility. Freedom of mobility is when you're a renter, if you're buying something, you're less likely to move because then you got to find a renter. You got to manage them from, you know, distance, long distance. Whereas if you're a renter, you can just hop anywhere, move to the next city, move to the next town. Next point, the risks are diverse. This one is the one that really got me, guys. This is usually one of the biggest arguments for apartments. I've never seen it made against apartments. And that's the risk are diversified across the many houses instead of being concentrated in one building, as in the case of multifamily. You can also eat, sell this first. Let's look at that part. Is he serious with that? That's one of the biggest arguments for multifamily is that you're not, the, you're concentrated in one area and, and you're not spread out. You know, if, if you're a big P company, institutional player coming in, buying a hundred, hundred houses at once, you know, in, a, in an area, in a town, in a neighborhood, they're built to rent. Sure. That makes perfect sense. But when you're, when you're buying one house at a time, maybe a couple at a time, spread out throughout a whole town um, or maybe even a whole county. They're all different buildings so that you can't stockpile parts because every house is different. That creates a lot of issues and that creates a lot of a lot of headwinds and, and speed bumps to scale. Um, for those that are familiar with Rod Cleef, he's a multifamily investor, has the biggest multifamily podcast. He was on this show. He talks about his, and if you're familiar with him, you're going to know what I'm alluding to here. He talks about his $50 million seminar. That's what he calls, you know, failures or seminars because you'll learn from them, right? Well, leading up to the 08 crash, he had $50 million of a portfolio that was predominantly in debt in the Denver area in single family homes. He said one of the leading factors, you know, to the downfall, obviously it was a big part of it was the debt structure, but it was, it was also the fact that it was just spread out everywhere. And, you know, you get a maintenance call and your guy's got to drive two hours somewhere and he doesn't have any parts with him because it's a different house. So he has to go assess what's needed. Then he has to go run to Home Depot or Lowe's. Then he's got to run back, fix it. And he's got to call to the next one. And we're probably already what, like four, five hours into the day versus having a hundred units in one 
area under, you know, in one complex, the units are pretty much all the same. They all take the same parts, same fixtures, and you can stockpile them either on property and storage, or maybe down the road in a storage unit. And if you have an issue, you can just go run and get them. There's only one to six, eight roofs for a hundred units versus, you know, hundred units, you're going to have hundred roofs. If that goes, that kills your cash flow. Um, maybe you're gonna have a chiller that takes care of a whole building that goes that it's expensive, but it's for hundred units. Whereas if your utilities go in one property, one single family home, that's one unit and you're spread out. That's a lot of risk t- to manage. And if, and then he talks about the next point is you can also diversify across geographies to further de-risk. Well, that to me increases your risk because now you're going into different states, different parts of the country that really increases your risk. You know, even if you have a well-oiled machine with systems and processes in place, that's really going to increase the risk. And to me, I don't, I just don't understand that argument because you know, you're going to be managing all these from different areas. Something happens, you can't get over there. Your team can't get over there. If you're not from intimate with that market, that just increases the risk. Versus, yeah, we may invest, you know, in different markets, but we're all concentrated in one, in one community. We have on-site staff that have eyes on the property every single day. We have a property management company that also has eyes on the property. Then we have asset management that has eyes on them. That reduces the risk. So I just some of these I don't get. And so his he sums it up here. Some of the other tangible benefits: lower entry costs. Yeah, but at what cost? To increase your risk. Yeah, you're buying. Sometimes not even, it really depends on the market, right? Some markets you can get a duplex cheaper than a single family home and per unit, you're probably going to get cheaper than a single family home. So, you know, but at what cost you know, your, re- your risk is increasing in my opinion, easier financing. That depends right now. I don't think so. I think commercial financing a lot easier and get better rates non-recourse. So it can't go against you. They can't go after your personal assets. They're just looking at your, your PFS, your personal financial statement, the assets you have, They're not really digging into, you know, your credit rating or other debts you have. It's really based on the asset you're buying. So I think it's actually easier in my opinion, a lot easier, less tenant turnover. Again, that's, that's negotiable. It all comes down to, to operations management. Um, and sometimes you, you want some amount of turnover so you can turn the units and get higher rent. But at the end of the day, I do get it. High high turnover is a killer of this game. So you don't want high turnover. Higher appreciation. Uh maybe maybe recently with the in certain markets with people moving, but even so, what people cap rates what people were paying for a commercial multifamily has been insane. You know, doubling property values in three years, five years. That's crazy appreciation. I, don't, I guess I'd have to look more on the numbers, but I, I, I don't see it. And then he says, that's a wrap. So that's a wrap for me. Just wanted to get on here. I saw that and, and it's kind of just blown my mind. And I, I haven't really talked about, you know, fundamental base stuff on multifamily investing in a while. So I thought it'd be a great topic to come on and why I love it. It just provides scale. It provides, it's a business, right? It's you're operating a business. Um, which to me, if you know what you're doing, can reduce the risk and provide higher returns, um, more stable returns, higher appreciation. Because his point of appreciation, that's based on comps. This is based on NOI. So as you increase the NOI, your value goes up. And then if cap rates are decreasing in that in that market while you're increasing NOI, then it exponentially goes up. And that's what we saw, you know, not currently with, you know, cap rates, you know, expanding because of interest rates going up. But you know, the last couple of years, that's what we saw. We saw people going in, renovating, getting higher rents. NOI was going through the roof all while cap rates were compressing, going down, which created exponential growth. So yeah, I love I love this asset class and I just want to get on here and share that. So as always, everybody, easy doesn't pay well and instant gratification is self-destructive. So not only get out there and work hard for your money, but have your money work hard for you so we can all create the lives of our dreams and make this world a better place. All right, catch you on the next one. Hey, this is Sean Winslow. After being in the financial service industry for years and having candid conversations with good people just like you, I realized that so many of us are wanting an investment strategy that provides solid returns and consistent income without the bumps in the road. There's little known secret that your financial advisor doesn't want you to know. There is investment out there that is less volatile and the returns are stronger. 
Get more details by going to greenbriarcg.com and clicking on the free e-report. And by the way, if this show has provided you any value, then feel free to leave an honest written review and of course, share it with a friend who needs it. See you next week for another great show.